Welcome to another D-Day event. Um, tonight we talk uh, about the spaceship Earth. This is our topic. We chose uh, the term from Buckminster Fuller to better understand how to run our global system. And um, yeah, and today we want to talk about how to best hack and improve the global system, actually. And uh, why we need to talk about this. Uh, today we see uh, massive global problems, economical, ecological, social problems, like an ongoing social, an ongoing uh, financial crisis, um, climate change, or uh, the refugee situation. So, and uh, since global leaders have massive problems to, to, uh, yeah, to tackle all these problems, we, um, we witness uh, grassroots movements who, um, yeah, who deal with these problems, who come up with new approaches, and um, yeah, and to talk about new, these new approaches and these new methods, we uh, invited two leading social innovators, which will be introduced by Boris. Hi. Thanks, Andrea. Hi, uh, welcome. Happy to see everybody uh, for the first time or for the second or this is our sixth D-Day and uh, we're happy to see so many coming back and uh, joining the conversation. We will have a talk with our two guests and then open up to the audience and have your questions and statements as part of the evening. I think that is always the very important and also vivid part. So um, who is here today with us? Alexa Clay, she's an author, um, creative uh, mind, uh, a social hacker and author of the book uh, Misfit Economy. Let me show you the book. Um, and she has uh, interviewed many interesting minds um, and um, looked into what can we learn not only from the likely but also the unlikely heroes, those uh, unsung stories of uh, gangsters, um, dealers, but also hackers and uh, those outside of the system. And uh, she's uh, running the human agency. She is a co-chair of the League of Intrapreneurs, uh, an organization for corporate social change. And uh, we'll have a chance to talk about her insights, about her stories, about her uh, encounters with these great minds. And uh, also with us tonight is Mark uh, Tushinsky, who is uh, the co-director and founder of Tactical Tech. It's an organization, a collective that is enabling activists and uh, giving them digital tools, digital guidelines, and, and how to do their work best, how to uh, work in the states of surveillance, how to work within the frameworks of mass media, and how to challenge the given state of mind. So let us welcome, uh, with a warm applause, Alexa Clay and uh, Mark Tushinsky. And, and Alex, let me start right away with you. I think this, this, this book uh, is definitely setting a tone. Um, when I first heard lessons in creativity from pirates, hackers, gangsters, and other informal entrepreneurs. Well, that, that's, that's quite a statement when you say in your book that we can learn from those people as much as from Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. How do you characterize misfits? What are the main, let's say, perspectives, aspects? Um, yeah, well, initially the book really started as a joke project, actually. Uh, I gave a fake talk at South by Southwest because I became really uh, annoyed with this idea of disruption and innovation. And so I wanted to really say, well, what if the next kind of social media trends we can learn from Mexican drug cartels? Or what can we learn from you know the financing techniques that terrorists are using? And so it was kind of this tongue-in-cheek irony. And then the more research that we did, the more th that we actually looked at some of these personalities and realized you know, there's a lot we can learn from the underground and informal and black market economy. Um, and specifically, really trying to transform this persona or this script around entrepreneurship, where you know, so often the, the idea of an entrepreneur that comes to mind is this you know, Silicon Valley kind of wunderkind. And we were really looking at this idea of uh, the entrepreneur is the gangster, the entrepreneur is the hacker or the artist or the activist. And so you know, when I first started using this word misfit, my mother, uh, 
whenever I tell her my ideas, she sort of makes this space. And so she's like, misfit, what do you mean? Do you mean weirdos? Do you mean uh, people with autism? What does that mean exactly? And so over time, it really, we looked at four different topologies of, of misfit actors. Um, the first was really those underground sets, so people that are really marginalized from the mainstream economy, uh, that are really in those gray markets, in those black markets. We also looked at the runaway misfit, so people that are uh, voluntarily choosing to somehow drop out of the system, and there's this question of whether or not you can actually ever drop out of the system. Uh, I spoke to a lot of hermits who, interestingly enough, have their own electronic newsletters for staying connected. So um, that was one personality, the kind of bohemian uh, identity. We also looked at people that are proking and prodding the system, so the activists, um, you know, people that are questioning the system from the outside. And then lastly, we looked at this idea of the the entrepreneur, the, the real insider misfit. So someone who has a countercultural agenda, but is a little bit more camouflaged with that agenda. Who, you know, people that are actively trying to transform bureaucratic cultures from within, who are building out, um, you know, future business models, uh, and, and who are trying to affect change at scale. I think, you know, a lot of them are these Robin Hood types. But you also see saboteurs within those institutions. So people that are really actually believe in a theory of change that's all about taking down the existing system. And so part of the fun in the book was actually seeing how um, there were lots of tactics that, you know, hacker tactics that were used by entrepreneurs, for example, or how artists were actually developing their entrepreneurial mindset to deal with this transition economy. So some of the fun was seeing those interconnections. I thought it was also interesting in the book that you, you mentioned some principles, what makes you a misfit in the end. I thought it, it would be interesting to, to learn a little bit about this and uh, maybe you have some examples. So what can we learn from the hackers and the hustlers? Yeah, so the book is organized around five main principles. Uh, the first is really this idea of hustle, which is something that you see within the black market economy, this street hustle um, that you really see within Silicon Valley. And so looking at resourcefulness, frugality, being able to do something with a little, the sort of dogged determination to get things done, you know, that burning drive and ambition. Uh, we also focused on hacking, and so hacking not just as computer hacking, but as culture hacking. Right. I think a lot of the work and you know my vocational identity is much more around culture hacking. How do we um, transform cultures? How do we not just see cultures as stagnant things to study, but how do we sort of transform corporate cultures? How do we transform uh, norms around you know money, around relationship? And so uh, that's one principle where we look at a variety of different hackers. Uh, both computer hackers and culture hackers. And then uh, we looked at this spirit of copying, and so this idea that actually open source culture is really influencing a lot of these mis misfits, and so how do we think about ownership within a very different kind of paradigm? Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about that. And then looked at this spirit of provocation. Uh, so, you know, I was raised in many ways by misfits. Um, my mother studied alien abduction, uh, so talked That's to people crazy. around the world that thought they'd been abducted by aliens, uh, which was very scary to my childhood self. Um, and then yeah. I also, I mean, I say this now, so it's sort of boring, but I was, I, there was a part of me too that just wanted, like we're talking about spaceship Earth, mm -hmm. And part of me was always like, well, I want this alien consciousness. Like, I actually am more interested in being this ambassador. Uh, and was really disappointed over time, like at an egoic level, that I wasn't being abducted. Uh, and so all to say, like, I think there was something about my upbringing that had me really question the Western consciousness that we were born into. Um, and I think that's the spirit of provocation, this idea that you can actually really um, see limitations within consciousness and also begin to see alternative realities. So one of the subcultures that I've written a, lo a lot about recently is live action role playing. Um, I don't know how many people have done that before. Raise, no? Do you guys know? Yeah, so s you know what it is. Raise your hand if you know what it is. Okay, great. Yeah, so maybe you associate this with like nerds running around in the woods or in Berlin with swords or in parks. Um, and sometimes that's true, but it's also, I think, a much more sophisticated genre, particularly if you're like a Nordic LARPer. 
Um, and so the whole tradition there is with LARP, you can actually prototype futures. You can live out any kind of reality that you want to. And so from the perspective of provoking, mm -hmm. it's amazing to actually be able to pop up these temporal realities and play a character where you have these design constraints. You know, when we were at this eco-hacking camp together for five weeks. I know you'll the share last time more. The we saw each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In France, yeah. Uh, you know, so when we were in these, like, using compost toilets and spending five weeks in this crazy situation, we were kind of in an extended LARP. And everyone left that experience feeling like they had this hunger for living in community in a very different way. And also living, um, you know, producing goods in a very different way. You know, our identities at that camp weren't as consumers. So in this temporal experience, we were actually able to hack the economic identities that we sure. wear. Yeah. And this is one of the, I'll stop talking about LARP in a very quick second, but one of the beauties of it is that you have this phenomenon called bleed, which is where your identity, um, the character that you play in a LARP starts to bleed into your own identity. And so it's a way of, of hacking yourself. I so see. that's really the spirit of provocation. And then the last principle is around pivoting, which um, I started calling rabbit hole for a really long time in the book. And then our editor thought that sounded too druggy. Um, and it was sort of druggy. Uh, and so <laughs> the idea of personal pivots that people make. All of the misfits that we profiled, almost all of them, have these enormous abilities to jump from one world to the next, to bring one discipline uh, into you know, solving a problem that someone would have thought of before. So that's roughly how it's organized. Okay. Uh, tactical tech, Marek. Uh, you are challenging political systems. So uh, you might be a misfit in a way on your own, on the way uh, how you, what, what your approaches are. So I will be interested in uh, what is your perspective, on what is the role of misfits from, from uh, yeah, what you learned with tactical tech and uh, what you, what you, what you was done, you know. Hi everyone. Um, so to answer your question uh, in an interesting way, and I will be slower maybe for a change, <laughs> um, is that I would redefine the term of the misfit, I believe, in the first place. Um, which I think in the book is a, is a fantastically described, and I would recommend you to get the book whenever you have a chance. Uh, I've read 78% of it, and it is great 78% so far. Um, we started, you refer me as an individual, but as organization, so I will speak as organization that I run at this point. You can approach me individually later if you want. So, Misfits for us, uh, is kind of a, the meaning I would associate with the misfit is when you use uh, your creative part of your brain. And it uh, doesn't have to be against something or for something. Specifically, it is often where there's a very scarce uh, set of opportunities for you. You have to come up with an idea that would go against the stream or kind of sideways approach a problem. And often in the environment that I work with, uh, there is very little that you can officially or legally, if you like, uh, or politically do. So our work is often focusing on uh, places, and that's not necessarily geographical places that can be in Berlin ev even, where people are not able to express themselves. They're not able to kind of experience the fundamental rights they have to, such as uh, accessing information or uh, creating knowledge all organizing themselves there's a lot of these people here and uh, not in this room uh, but in the city and so for us the power of information <coughs> technology is that that it at least maybe for a second may enable a lot of people and make them do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do but we are not very romantic about that either so it has pluses and cons mm. but also in your work um you probably ran into um the definitions of what is legal and illegal and um, by providing these toolkits and guides to, to activists in regions where it is quite difficult to operate. Um, what is your personal experience um, as, as your definition of legal and illegal? So it's interesting. Uh, I won't answer that directly. I, I answer it kind of a, through the story, I guess. It's better to do that this way. On one hand, uh, what's legal or illegal is determined by whoever is in power and that can be a power in the house in your household who, who, 
who holds the remote control or uh, you know what is what is normative or not uh, in a society is more complicated and um, and for us uh, we often face a situation that a lot of things that we consider very legal uh, coming from uh, our upbringing on places we're coming to um, uh, by actually how they will be designed and when you look at the design then it's uh, it's, a, it's a much more complicated so we I differentiate things into illegal and non-legal if you like so there's there are moments in your life when we can you can tweak you can push the system which you are still within the normative framework of not being criminal and and yet you are um, challenging those who set the norm or whatever and um, in other cases you have to be f head on yeah. illegal and you have to do something that would be considered criminal but then, then then there's a kind of a fine line and the story i wanted to tell you is that uh, if facebook is paying uh, four thousand pounds tax uh, in the uk is this illegal is this legal and so you have this um, notion in different places where uh, Actors that are, if they're big enough, if they're heads of states or if they're corporations, they can push norms much farther than individuals. And what we often see, and who is punished, are individuals, not the large institutions. So I would like to look at these problems of legality and illegality in, in, in normativeness in, in, the, in the context between individual and institution, and also the state. Um, so. That's not a good answer, huh? Right. No, that's a perfect answer. It's basically the questioning of, of um, what the framework is. And um, Alexa, I'm sure when you were talking to all these interviewees that um, your concept of that might have uh, changed as well. Yeah, I mean, I would actually agree uh, with your point, too, that the sort of boundaries around illegality are always changing. Um, and so, yeah, who is determining what is legal and illegal? Um, there were really great examples, actually, within this idea of copying culture. You know, the U.S., the whole U.S. industrialization was paved in part because of, co you know, patents that they stole from, from Europe and commercialized entirely illegally, uh, you know, in America. And so now it's a little bit ironic that, you know, the U.S. is so focused on patent protection, you know, particularly against other countries, you know, Brazil and India and, and definitely China. Um, and even China, now that it's beginning to sort of export its own uh, products, is beginning to develop a different orientation to patents. Um, and so I think you always see, you know, the history of, of capitalism in so many ways is also the history of these shadow markets. Um, you have... You know, and it, during periods of rapid industrialization, you always had uh, these enormous, uh, you know, smuggling markets that were operating. Um, and I think it's, you know, we look very kindly on some of these kinds of historic rogues or historic criminals. We have a lot of empathy, um, you know, when we see, you know, when we read books about them or we see television programs about them. And then in the present day, somehow that empathy goes away. Somehow in the present, you see things more through this lens of good and evil. Um, and so, you know, it takes that historic memory to look at things a little bit more in perspective. But yeah, I think we've gotten some slack with the book around this question of are you glamorizing illicit activity? And, you know, certainly not. I think there's tons of things that you can read about how horrible, um, you know, criminals are. And I think our perspective was, well, actually, let's show how a lot of people that were born into very different kinds of circumstances and born into par poverty largely are going about, you know, creating products and services and, you know, operating in slums and, you know, creating a livelihood really out of nothing. And so the whole premise that we're looking at things through the lens more of creativity and innovation and so not really bringing a moral... Um, a moral lens to things. At the same time, I was more interested in characters uh, who really were hacking cultures they were born into. So you can be a cog in the machine and work for a Mexican drug cartel or the mafia. Um, so for me, those weren't misfits within those organizations. Those were conformists within those organizations. And so I really tried to focus on people who, um, who were transforming cultures. Someone like King Tone, for example, who Ask this question of how do we turn Who the Latin was King, King Tone again? I think well, I don't know if many people know no? him. Okay. 
Jorgito knows. Who knows King Tone? <laughs> uh, King Tone was the former leader of the Latin Kings, which is one of the biggest Hispanic street gangs that originated in Chicago. And he was basically someone that tried to do an entire change management approach of a gang organization. So he said, how do we transition this underground gang into a social movement? like the Black Panthers or something like this. Um, and so a lot of people, the FBI included, uh, accused him of running a vicious PR campaign, sort of greenwashing of the gang. Uh, but he was making concrete changes. You know, he started a task force within this gang um, during another person, uh, another person when they were running it to really figure out how could they develop activist skills within this gang organization? How could they use the gang as a feeder, um, as an important sort of labor incubator for connecting young people from low-income communities with, jo with necessary job skills? And so I think that was really incredible. And he was shut down because he was... Yeah, he was very deeply threatening to the powers, the powers that existed. And so I think there is this bigger question that, you know, I hope we get to today of like how um, how insurgent should you be? I think, you know, as maybe social innovators, I feel like my cultural hacking is fairly tame compared to more radical approaches. Um, but in certain ways, that means it can be more successful. So I think it's, you know, they're all different kinds of personalities that can bring different levels of annoyance into systems. And so really being able to understand the choreography between those actors becomes an important part of so social change. Mm -hmm. So maybe as an example, Marek, um, because in, uh, I read about this, uh, how you supported environmental activists in, in Africa by providing tools, and uh, how has that impacted their role and, and uh, their, let's say, campaigning and ability to reach out and uh, make a change? In the case on the, of, of the environmental groups, I don't know if you're aware of that, but in the recent report of a, a Global Witness, this is the most uh, endangered group of activists uh, around the world. The, the most killings against uh, activists or investigators <laughs> or journalists are about those who, those who are environmental activists. And we just did a kind of a, an iteration of a toolkit that we've been running for uh, 10 years that is uh, helping activists to protect themselves, protect their information, but also protect their sources. And that's very important because uh, all the process of trying to create change is usually very long. And it's not three days, it's not three weeks, it's uh, not even three years. It's usually much longer than that if you look at serious uh, changes, social, cultural, or political changes. So it's very important to be able to preserve uh, the power and, and abilities of, of people and also uh, give them a tools to uh, work with information and evidence. And for us, that's that's what's the most important. The technology is just a medium, and it's changing every uh, every moment. Thank you. And um, but what is who is using technology are people, and for us uh, they create uh, change. But ag again, and kind of uh, in contrast to the book that is, I think it's 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 it's, it's very important to read it. Is that our focus is not necessarily on the in individual. So who we address. Uh, is that the people that you would not read the story. Those are not the entrepreneurs, they are not the people who give the name even to their work um, because they can't or they don't want to. And, and f that's why the way we publish our materials enables anybody in any way access them as anonymously as possible. And so far we also do not collect fantastic stories about how uh, what we offer is being used because we don't want to necessarily know that. But your work has two, two uh, let's say, layers. One layer is this of securing the privacy of uh, the people you work with. And on the other hand, it's also visualization and uh, making the in data visible. So b basically working with the, un the invisible and uh, making it accessible to a broader audience. Sure, because the real currency of, of any kind of form of activism, of dissent, of uh, re rebellion, and uh, in the systemic and so on, is the currency is information. That's what people have, um, nothing else. And, and this is the way you can challenge uh, yourself, uh, you know, the society you are in, or, or the power, if there's any power that you can actually see. And, uh, and for us, information is data, is evidence, is all that we talk so much about in recent years. But having it is, is one thing, and doing something with it is another thing, right? And uh, obviously, there's not a single visualization or a poster or you know, a creative act that would change the world or even 
little fragment of it. What it enables is enables actually people to recognize that there may be a problem that they, they can act together. So for us, this ways of working with, with data, information, and evidence is more finding ways of, of collaborating and understand the world, if you like. And um, since we have now powerful devices and we can analyze information as never before, we can also translate that to narratives and propose these narratives through channels that were not available before. This is what the work is about. And if you use then a combination of a visual storytelling or mixed up with organizing and knowing who you're trying to influence with that information and kind of uh, in a way in line with the narrative of the book, I think that the biggest challenge we have and the groups have is not necessarily the specific uh, persona of a power, whoever that is, but those who are neutral, indifferent, uninterested. Uh, because I think convincing people who are avoiding taking up uh, difficulties uh, is, is the most powerful way of doing activism. But uh, talking about this, uh, making the invisible visible, and about big data, actually, I was wondering, also visiting your exhibition at the Hakavi, um, you had uh, quite interesting installations there. W and I was wondering, what can we learn from big data? You know, how to reorganize systems and to empower uh, activists. Yeah, that's the kind of, uh, you should go to Hakave. It's a great exhibition that we it's did, by the exhibition. way. It's a great exhibition, And then, regardless of what I'm going to say now, that may put you off, actually, maybe. Uh, the exhibition is, in a way, is about big data. There's a lot of exhibitions about big data in Europe right now. And we try to be different because we try to look at data through the human perspective. So the perspective you get when you enter the space is that everything you see is from the human eyesight view. And you see humans in images, in historical examples, and in some current political examples. Because for us, that's critical. The data, what it does in the first place is, is mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. It's so big that you can't compute it and so forth, you imagine that it would give you some answers to very important questions. And and we look at these two aspects of that. So on one hand, you have people who believe that if you collect it all, if you gather all the information possible, then you can stop the disease or you can stop the inequality or you can you know look at the, how we call it, the spaceship Earth and move it other direction. <laughs> Hopefully, they don't want to do that. Um, on the other hand, um, we also know that um, we struggle with that, that uh, the software you use, the code, the algorithm that we uh, use to analyze this data are written by us, and that we're not very perfect. And so for the analysis we do and the patterns we find are not necessarily the ones that are very helpful. So we look at these two aspects, the kind of the positive and then the negative, and that is kind of done in this environment of when you talk about data and politics, often you talk about the dystopian view where we are living in the world of Big Brother, surrounded by surveillance and so forth. Our take is more that uh, we're actually living in the data society now. That is more about supervision, that uh, as much as there may be a single actor trying to look at the data and information about us, we do that same ourselves. On the other hand, you have this uh, fascinating, more critical utopian view that we're living in a post-privacy world, so we should now reshape all the frameworks and so forth. And partially there's a true, true in it uh, that we can do that. Hmm? Post-privacy. As uh, Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, we're living in a post-privacy world, which means give up your privacy, use Facebook. And you know, a year later he bought a house and four houses around his house for $40 million to protect his privacy. Yeah. So what we're also trying to say is that privacy, instead of disappearing, is gaining new value. And we're looking at who can afford it, why, when, and so forth. Uh, what I also liked at the exhibition was you, you um, uh, there was this app, what was it called again? Sick weather app, right. Yes. And because we know all this, this predominant narrative of the Silicon Valley, actually, and what is a successful uh, entrepreneur, I think you both have, have, have an opinion on that. And I, I really like you know, the examples on what can be a successful entrepreneur on this exhibition 
the nervous system. So uh, maybe you have also an, something to say about this? I think it would be nice to actually have an argument about that. It's very interesting. Argue. Uh, uh, arguing is very good. Yeah. It's <laughs> not like we will uh, shout at each other and no worries. How are we going to argue? Let, let's try to argue. Because okay. uh, so the take uh, we have in the exhibition, I think, on the specific kind of entrepreneurs in, in the Silicon Valley and Sig Weather and Healthy Day are examples of right. applications. I have to explain probably to you what the application does. Uh, you run it on a mobile phone or a computer and uh, you can see who is Sig around you. And as you can see, if they have flu or they have uh, whatever, any kind of illness, etc. And the data is gathered centrally. And um, actually, the, the Healthy Day is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson who developed the application. And they offer services to government when they can help them you know, tell you a view what's going on in the, in the country and so forth. At the same time, the data is not only taken from you where you intentionally write into the app that, oh, I have a headache today or something. But when you sign up with, with Facebook or another service, you sign up that they sell the information to third parties. And what's actually happening whenever you use words like, um, you know, stomach ache, that goes immediately to sick weather. Mm -hmm. And that enables them to create a map and so forth. So um, our take on, on that is that it's nothing wrong with that theoretically. Practically, whoever is creating a quite sophisticated surveying system where you on one hand feeling very empowered by it because you know which neighbors you should avoid. But you are the dot in this map as well and uh, other people will avoid you uh, when you are sick. And when you take that to the political level, it's becoming more complicated if that is about deciding about your credit score or uh, other kind of vital for you decisions by institutions, then we're living in a kind of more complex an environment. And uh, so we look at the entrepreneurship, uh, I think, of Silicon Valley through large co corporations like Google, Palantir, or uh, Facebook. From this point of view of what's happening right now, I think is kind of interesting, where a number of them, not very big number of them, has a, probably the biggest aggregation in the history of uh, our civilization, probably of humanity, of knowledge. Um, nobody knows more than Google about you. Uh, they know more than your uh, you know, intimate friends. Um, uh, because you ask Google questions, you wouldn't ask them. And they also probably run Android, or you run you know, Google Analytics and stuff like that. Um, and then um, they also aggregate the biggest wealth. They become the wealthiest corporation in the world in February. And who is the competition? Apple. You know, the old idea of corporations is gone. It's not anymore Shell or others. And yet, if you look at the revolving door and access to power they have through that in terms of how they can look at elections and other things, that's very unusual. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about entrepreneurship, especially in the data-driven entrepreneurship, it's not that straightforward. It's not something that I would be proud of now from the political point of view. Because uh, yes, it's driven by massive creativity, but who can challenge that power is my question then. Well, maybe Alexa, that's exactly what, what, what you can uh, give us an insight to when you talk about misfit strategies. Uh, how can these misfit strategies um, change or influence mainstream phenomena or co corporations of that size? I mean, when you talk about uh, social innovation and, and corporations, I think that that is exactly your argument then, no? Yeah, I mean, I think you see misfit strategies operating on all different scales. So, for example, with Silicon Valley culture, um, one little performance character that I've been doing for a few years now is the Amish futurist, who is an alter ego that I use where I dress up like as an Amish woman and I wear this bonnet and I go to like Tech Open Air or South by Southwest or these conferences and I ask startup founders um, these really hard questions. You know, why are you developing that app? What is its bigger sort of purpose in the world? And so that's kind of like performance art meets Socratic inquiry. Um, but it's, it's interesting to hear that actually so many of these people that are sort of trapped within the Silicon Valley mold, when they articulate what they actually stand for, the values that they stand for, are so different from what they're actually doing in the world. And I think a lot of people feel like that. A lot of people that work for huge companies um, are really checking themselves at the door. They're not allowed to bring all of their self into the workplace. And so what interests me more are characters 
um, like entrepreneurs, you know, people that are able to step into a company like BP or like Ford and speak truth to power and try and use those resources in clever ways. And I think um, I think it's good to be critically minded of these companies. Some of them won't actually be able to transition, and I think government has to do a you know a really good job of regulating. Um, and restricting license to operate. In San Francisco right now, all these companies are privatizing resources rather than building um, city infrastructure, rather than you know putting their taxes into sort of transport links and things like this. They have their own private buses. Um, and so that's really dangerous when you don't see companies contributing to a commons in the way that in the ways that they used to. Um, and so, but there are, there are entrepreneurs, you know, you see entrepreneurs in government within bureaucracies. Um, there was a guy I met who worked at Ford Motor Company who pioneered human rights practices within the company, um, who got the company thinking about producing things beyond just automobiles. And I think, you know, there's maybe a misfit, uh, addiction sometimes to falling into this trap where you just want to be the lone misunderstood outsider. You know, I even have an addiction to outsider perspective. Like I love coming places and figuring it out and not feeling, you know, part of cultures that I find gross. Um. But are there examples from misfit, uh, uh, you know, uh, ventures which become mainstream? And uh, is this the goal actually? I mean, it should be, you know, to, to really design a kind of a new normal. I just want to, before you answer that question, I'm sure you have a better answer than me, but I would actually challenge that and say that, uh, I would say that uh, all the people who funded Google and so on are, are the, the misfits, because it seems like the kind of a face of capitalism that they're promoting is based on that principle that uh, they took over the role of the avant-garde and misfits and kind of a creative pushers of the system, because what Google is doing, for example, is that uh, they push every single behavior to the maximum until somebody tells them it's not okay, and then they value it against how much it's gonna cost them to get lawyers on that case. This is the ethics they use. Mm -hmm. This is how they use uh, legal frameworks and so forth. And in that pure sense, yes, they are the pirates, really. And that's why it's so difficult to challenge them, because they are uh, um, rich, and uh, they have you know, kind of enormous. Um, in a way, that creates uh, a strange environment that they are who we always wanted us to be. On the other hand, it's only a few of them, and they're driven by a very specific mindset uh, that believes in the value of data and information. And that is immediately control. It's a massive control. We don't see that control yet, per se. And it's very strange for us to talk about it, because whatever they do is also empowering us. We never had such a good, you know, ways of translating one language to another. We never had better maps. We never had better email. We never had, you know, you name it. We never could mm -hmm. find things better than we do now. So, yeah. in a short run, they are fantastic. In the long run, they create an environment that we will be living very soon in, or oh, actually probably already are, um, which is very hard to challenge. And uh, I would be kind of my question, though your question would be, what kind of misfits we need to be able to challenge that system that these misfits created. Um. And I, I think, too, the question is around mission drift. Like, I think a lot of things that emanated out of San Francisco in the 80s and 90s that were precursors to the companies that you see now were actually, you know, really countercultural ideas. Um, you know, people thought the Internet would be radically different than it is now. And I think a lot of people felt betrayed by the dystopia that it became. Um, you know, you had things like the Whole Earth Catalog and, you know, festivals like Burning Man, and there was this real awakening to the power of citizen production, to this idea of disrupting companies altogether. And then people sold out on those dreams for various reasons, but one of the main reasons being finance. Um, so I think if you, if there is a sector where we need more misfit energies, it's really within the financial system of how do we create more decentralized, you know, financial systems? Uh, how do we not just, you know, allow, how do we train entrepreneurs too so that they don't have to sell out, so they don't have this mission drift that happens? How do we b make them better negotiators? How do we make them, how do we bring some of these founders that do feel, you know, deeply betrayed by the companies that they started and bring those lessons back to this growing set? Um, I think it's interesting to talk, to talk about ownership here because you, you one of the, your principles was copying, like copycats. 
And uh, if we understand that this is one of the most fundamental uh, processes in nature, to take what's there, to improve it, to mesh it up, to, to reach the next level, then you can also say there is a kind of a collaborative intelligent uh, which improves our system. And then it's really the question is then ownership a total myth? And, um, uh, and also, you know, to patent things. And uh, so what's about, you know, opening it up and, uh, yeah, copy systems? What do you think about this? I mean, Both this is you. how your, your tactical tech is built on that ethos, right? Well, uh, <laughs> thanks for calling me in to ask the question. Uh, <laughs> well, so tactical tech is, is built, yes, on the ethos of, I would say, uh, free software. And I use the word free software on purpose here because we commonly use open source. And open source only uh, kind of addresses one of the aspects of, of what you can do with software, which is read the code and see if the code is good on, or what the code is doing and so forth. While free software is looking at the uh, other political aspects of coding and uh, what actually free software enables you as a political actor. And th that for us was the ethos. That was the, the, the very important beginning of our work, really, uh, when you look at technology. But when you look at property, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more complex question because um, you probably wouldn't mind that some services are run and owned by uh, specific institutions that are built by taxpayer money and so forth. So, yeah. um, and it's place for them, and you see I would say rather when you look at the finances, uh, finance system that you address, that now we're living in a kind of a permanent crisis, especially permanent crisis of the West, or you can call it permanent crisis of the democracy. And economic crisis in the US is massive. You know, it's like sitting in Berlin and so, especially in the Soho House, we don't feel the crisis whatsoever. It's like it's not here, um, <laughs> not on this couch, not with these drinks, um, but it's it's here and. Um, and if we can create another financial system to do something with it, or if the entrepreneurship is the answer, I doubt it. I think this is kind of one of the last waves, in a way, where we find we find a commodity that has kind of abstract value. You know, if you look at the, uh, how Google is valued, or other corporations based that are based on data gathering and data basically trading. It's interesting because on the other hand, we know that we learn from this data very little. So how were they value so so highly and why we have this drive of startups and so forth to join that and then the golden rush, if you go to California and San Francisco, it's interesting when you go to places to talk to people, you have this feeling of cowboys uh, looking for the golden, golden you know, rush. grains. Right, there's, there's definitely this, this rush of doing something totally out of the box, new, but also when, when you formed Tactical Tech, you said this was a, a group of people um, from all over the world that at some point decided th the things that we're doing is so complex that we maybe should be in, in one place. So also focusing, bringing it together, and then why can't we have from these sort of initiatives, not necessarily not only free software, which you call it, but open source creative, collective creative uh, innovation. Well, I don't want to like focus more, like take the space from the book and uh, the message because that's kind of a fascinating conversation. But Tactical Tech was funded uh, around political freedoms. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, they were about the struggle between uh, like political powers, undemocratic countries and uh, totalitarian environments and activists that were defending human rights. And you know, 14 years later, we find ourselves in the space that at the beginning we believe that if uh, corporations would start using technology in a certain way and start using encryption and start, you know, started using uh, open source, then that would create a more open environment. And now we find ourselves in a kind of a double trouble, if you like, where our you know imaginary allies are probably much more problematic and complex enemies to our freedoms than we ever imagined. So yes, technology had at some point op opened for us the ability to uh, become political, and now we feel like um, it's not there anymore. And it's very complicated to explain that, if you like, because the technology is, you know, it's never, it's like basically it's neither good nor bad, but it's absolutely never neutral, never. But how can you um, create something positive? We were talking earlier about uh, the blogging platform Medium, which was uh, a place for um, multifaceted opinions, uh, alternative opinions, challenging opinions, and now uh, we find out that it was bought by Alphabet. 
uh, recently, um, so it belongs to Google, and that's maybe common knowledge. Uh, I just learned about it very recently, and I, I was uh, flabbergasted and realized, do I really want to work with Medium now the way I worked before? Mm -hmm. And uh, also means once you reach a certain level of relevance and success, um, you're getting swallowed. So what is it, coming back to this uh, misfit tactics, what can you do to create something that has is sustainable? I think you know you don't you don't have to uh, if you talk about information and how we share information and uh, how we get informed about what's going on. Luckily, internet is still what it was. It didn't change. What happened is the colonization and kind of accumulation of information. That now, for many people in many parts of the world, internet is it, it is the Facebook, because that's what is built in their mobile phone and so forth. So they they don't even realize that there's possibility for peer to peer. Uh, protected communication and this ability of you know that you can pop your own information kiosk anywhere on internet if you like and you can do it in an open or closed way however you want now there's a, there are ways for creating a trustful and confidential way of of exchanging information and so forth it's all built in the architecture of of what we have and the problem is that it's becoming criminalized now so on one hand you are you are being told that you know encryption is good if you use it with your bank or Google, but if you use it using Tor, then you are a terrorist. While the technology is the same, there's no difference there whatsoever. And it's kind of interesting to see that um, I think we have to rediscover what we already have in, in, in that way, I would say. Or hack it. Let's talk about hacking. Um, <laughs> I like the term, actually. Um, so. Uh, I was just thinking about an example. Maybe uh, most of you, they know John Draper, one of the first hackers, actually. Um, he developed the blue box and hacked the, 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 the telecom, uh, the, the telephone system. And um, yeah, and while uh, he went to jail, two of his best friends, which were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they started their first business out of this blue box. They improved it and sold it. And uh, so I was just wondering, I think this is a wonderful example how different the, the, the approach can be, you know, on hacking actually. And I would be interested on what, how would you define hackers and what are the motivations behind it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, hacking is a real, you know, spectrum or, you know, they're all different kinds of hackers with very different types of agendas. Um, I think with this, you know, with the example that you gave, you see constant, you know, elements of this where something from uh, the black market economy then becomes either co-opted or mainstreamed. And, you know, N Napster, for example, which paved the way for all these, you know, music file sharing sites, um, video streaming technologies, which were pioneered first in like illicit pornography websites, um, you know, even Shanzai kind of copycat cell phones, which then big phone operators started to use. Uh, and so, you know, I think this kind of, um, people have different orientations towards the system and sometimes it's about the system catching up. So, you know, what would be regulated then, you know, 10 years later becomes legal. Um, I think the danger too is when you have, you know, these incumbents like, you know, Google or these big companies that have the ability to define uh, what that regulation looks like and the ability to potentially out-regulate competitors uh, becomes really dangerous. Uh, but with hackers, you know, in the book, we really looked at a wide variety of hackers, you know. So anyone um, from sort of a classic sort of uh, person that believes in the freedom of inf information, that believes in the protection of privacy, those things might sound counterintuitive, but they're often mingled together, to, you know, someone um, hacking a problem of violence, you know? I think there's a there's social hacking, there's cultural hacking, you know, there's a reluctant misfit that we profiled in the book who spent um, 15 years studying infectious disease and then applied this model that he had learned in uh, working with uh, community health outreach workers to treating violence in urban cities and basically um, developed a whole program for mediating violence, you know, creating violence interrupters that were this informal uh, policing force around communities. And based on a simple insight of seeing how the patterns of how violence spreads is exactly how the patterns of infectious disease spread. 
Um, and so he was a hacker in the sense that he took one discipline and applied it in a very different context, but then he faced a lot of pushback. And so part of his hacks were actually around this question of how do I get the system to adopt my approach, which is a very different question than the hacker that believes in a more anarchistic kind of philosophy, uh, which is maybe around how do I take down the system or how do I build an alternative system? Uh, one of the metaphors that friends and I use a lot in Berlin is around the sort of island versus peninsula versus mainland orientation, which is, um, yeah, what is your approach to social change? Some people are trying to do social change from the mainland. They are the entrepreneur. Other people are, you know, really, you know, in that hacker isolationist standpoint of trying to create an alternative kind of culture, trying to bring down the mainland uh, or disengage entirely from it. And then, you know, the in-between space is the peninsula where you're attached to the mainland, but you still have enough isolation, enough separateness to protect some of what you're trying to do. Um, and I guess if you're there in the peninsula, the question is how do you prevent some of the things that you're working on from being co-opted? You know, Facebook and Zuckerberg will talk about, you know, that company now as a hacker company, which any hacker would object to. Um, you know, people now think that you can solve social problems within like a three-day hackathon. So I think there is a lot of that culture um, where you've lost some of that insurgency. Um, and that's why we need people to be able to police those types of things. Yeah. Actually, I really like the way that you equal and you make the misfit is the hacker. And so if you read this book, it's actually a book about hackers uh, that we call them misfits. I think misfit is nicer, is less scary uh, in a way because the hacker now means somebody that is dangerous, that will steal your data, your bank account and destroy your car while you're driving. Uh, which is very interesting because if you look at the Webster uh, definition or who, whatever dictionary uh, uh, from the time before media started dis describing hacker, hackers in a certain way, hacking meant basically improving the kind of, you know, twinking and uh, fiddling with things, trying to make them better. Um, and, and hacking, you know, human being by default is a hacker because we feel with tools, with technology from the beginning, from the early stage of Homo sapiens, if you like. But it's changed, and, and you also say that in the, in the book that, you know, what's hysterical actually, that Facebook address is, uh, the street name is, you know, Facebook is, is a hacker way, number one. Um, and it's interesting when you look at it, because again, coming back to the previous conversation, uh, previous uh, few sentences that we had about the power of these corporations and how they define their role in the society is that they, they, are, ha they are real hackers and they're really uh, going forward in pushing our understanding of how we organize society. And the funny way is that most of them coming from the single belief that this is very driven by cybernetics. And, uh, and this idea that, um, again, if we only collected all the information and data, we not only can create artificial intelligence, but we can find all the answers to all the problems that nobody before ever in the history was able to find. And, and that's quite scary. And, um, but hackers also, okay, th I mean, they have an, uh, um, yeah, uh, not always the best image, but they also help to, to um, bring light into inequality or to uh, conspiracy also. So I was also wondering how can they, um, especially because tactical tech is challenging the political system, how can they help to uh, improve democratic processes or political structures? What do you think about this? Well, you're talking about two different things, so I would not address in the same sentence uh, conspiracy mm -hmm. and other things, because conspiracy doesn't exist. Uh, conspiracy is, you know, is a is kind of surreal um, uh, situation that somebody is interpreting the world in such a way that they see that is driven by specific groups or ideologies, etc. And the name conspiracy is because the conspiracy theory is fictional uh, in most cases. There may be something behind it, there may be some truth, and it's interesting to look into that. Uh, why, when you look at the, the problems that a lot of uh, hackers or coders are trying to address, 
yes, they work with data. They try to you know turn evidence into something that is meaningful mm -hmm. and bring technology to places where there's not enough expertise and how to use it and what to do with it and so forth. There's a number of examples, but are those examples really seriously world changing? I would question that. I think they often are temporarily very significant, but um, this is not how we can drive the ship called Earth anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and then on the other hand, you know, it's becoming very depoliticized um, uh, in such a way that a lot of hackers who can be political that are running hacker spaces are focusing on, you know, 3D 3D printing from garbage plastic, um, which is you know quite sad. <laughs> no, but w l let's talk about as you said. This is a spaceship Earth, who's at the steering wheel. Um, this is the the driving question, and um, you've mentioned all these giant um, tech companies nowadays who do influence our lives. Um, at the same time, the hackers and hacker collectives like um, Anonymous are creating a counterweight. And what is their role in where our planet is, is moving towards to, or what can their role be in the future? I mean, I think, you know, the hacker ethos built around this, you know, really liberating information. Um, that transparency push has been enormously successful. You know, you had uh, Anonymous recently did a campaign where they released the identities of KKK members, um, you know, within the US that were in support of, you know, Trump rallies. Um, so those kinds of actions, I think, you know, they're providing a sort of moral policing of society. And, and I think, you know, they're not waiting for permission. Um, I think hackers like Anonymous, part of the reason that they're so successful is they give people this, um, anonymous yet collective voice to tap into where you know there's no boss of anonymous anyone can sort of participate in that culture anyone can propose an action it's very egalitarian in, in how it's structured um, and so I think groups like that are really you know important as prodders you know as people that are poking at culture and getting people to wake up um, and I think that awakening piece is huge. I think, you know, some of the sort of fascism um, rhetoric that you're seeing within definitely the U.S. right now, but also in, in certain European countries in response to refugees is really scary. Um, and, you know, who are going to be the people that are, you know, steering the ship towards, you know, living out a different version of society? Uh, I think, you know, some of those people are really going to be, you know, grassroots community, populist community. Some of them will be hackers. Some of them will be entrepreneurs. And so I think, you know, in among the change agents that I've worked with, I think it's really important for um, for different people to be able to have compassion for each other. Uh, I was, you know, part of the Occupy movement in the U.S. Uh, it's interesting to see how now that entire vocabulary is basically becoming the the left progressive vocabulary in this election cycle that you know the language that Bernie Sanders is using came from the occupy movement is now being used by Hillary Clinton so she can spout her progressive ideals as well um, and so you know maybe that's the risk again of co-option that you have someone like Hillary Clinton who's much more a sort of insider gaming the system using this occupy language but I think actually the most powerful thing is if you can spur this alternative power if you can really invest in alternative power outside of the political process that then affords the necessary leverage for entrepreneurs to be able to do their job. I once knew a woman who was working at a company that used to leak information to uh, Greenpeace and she was a total entrepreneur because she said if you have this information if you can do a campaign around this then I can get this through you know and I think that's the kind of allyship or secret allyship that we have to be able to create and I think the more empathy that we can have for different people creating creating change within various parts of the system, that's a really good thing. I think for me, the, to answer your question is that disruption is extremely important, and not for the sake of disruption. Disruption often uh, is important because opens the spectrum of mm -hmm. our plays and gives the space for people to exercise different ways. So it's kind of more like a mental spaces that disruption is creating because it's often showing that the emperor is naked or uh, you know, it's kind of challenging the way we see things and so forth. The problem I think we see nowadays with the disruption that is mediated through technology is that technology 
turned out to be extremely good at helping us to organize, mobilize. We've seen a lot of waves of very strong uh, you know, bonding at the time of organizing and mobilizing, but we also see that they die very quickly. And technology, the same technology somehow, and I would propose a theory for that, is not enabling us to s sustain these movements. Um, and the reason I think for that is that um, kind of in a more complex, you know, capitalist, uh, symbolic environment, uh, technology is empowering us as individuals. We have never been so much individual as we are while using technology. And this individual empowerment is taking away something else, which is the empowerment as, as communities and as groups across borders, across countries, issues, and so, and so forth. And um, we have these moments of empowerment individually as, as temporary groups, like Anonymous and so forth, or Occupy. But because we are so individually threatened by these devices, there's no way that can accumulate anywhere and turn into any pro kind of you know political proposition. So what we see Occupy is a very interesting case that people immediately where they are in a single place, in a single location, try to create a better world and they try to create every, every, every single rule is better and put together at the same time, which has no chances of, of surviving, obviously, because you have to leave this space at some point. And then, and then technology is betraying you immediately. And so for, for me, it's kind of interesting to work in this environment with the notion that we're promoting also technology, um, how to make ourselves aware that we're living in this kind of paradox of the self environment where um, we are more powerful when we are connected, when you're looking at our screen, and a few moments later, the data we generated, uh, you know, using your word of a system, creates a system that is not recognizing us as individuals and is not enabling us as groups to propose anything. But I would say the same is true of politics as well. I think the biggest thing that we have to overcome is this yeah, paradox of the self or this kind of consumer orientation. The whole political system, at least uh, in the US, it treats each person as a consumer, where all that you're asked to do politically or to further civic culture is around, you know, voting for someone else. So you're really, it's a, it's a outsourcing. Like democracy is kind of about outsourcing in some ways. And I think if you look at the great political movements of the past, it hasn't been built on that outsourcing instinct. It's actually been based on a call to action that's much deeper. That is about uh, collective mobilizing. That's about building common resources. That's about um, you know, coming together and building, you know, resilient communities, um, often in the wake of government failure. And I think, I think that's really, you know, I think technology is creating such a fragmented attention economy, um, and really creating so many conditions of further isolation and alienation that we don't necessarily have the capacity to really engage in some of that collective work that's to be done. I think time poverty is also a huge issue that people just don't have the time to engage in civic culture in the ways that they might have. Right. And I think in another aspect, and maybe after that question, we'll, we'll pass it on to the audience. So if, if you have questions, just um, give me a second, and we'll have a microphone somewhere here that will... Uh, be uh, going around. Um, looking at media, when you say um, there have been smaller publications in the past and conspiracies were obscure, now these obscure conspiracies become sort of news or commodity or something that people believe in as if they were mainstream media just because of the numbers. So how do you uh, deal with that sort of uh, change in, in the media production and media consumption? Yeah, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the the sort of power of the internet and new media means that you can have all these misfit communities that previously felt really alienated in their ideals um, actually begin to create norms, begin to create consensus around some of their countercultural ways of thinking. So in that way, you know, I was reading a book about witches earlier this morning, and it was amazing when all of these witches like learned about the internet and could find each other online and felt like they were 
no longer these weird, uh, you know, people that they could actually share information and share spells with each other. Uh, and so, you know, you see that also within, you know, political organizing. That suddenly, you know, people with very different kinds of ideas can can find this source of community. I think, you know, the the other side to that is that you you know the internet is kind of this crack machine in which you have so much traditional media being bastardized by this um, short term sort of attention span where you have these clickbait articles. And I think that's kind of like the first wave of, you know, when LSD came about in the, you know, in its first wave, it people thought they were, you know, you know, beta testers essentially of this new phenomenon. Um, and it really messed with people. And I think that's kind of what the first wave of like internet media has done with us, that it's really like fucked us up uh, emotionally, psychologically, and that hopefully we're now in a point where we can be more intentional about the kind of media that we consume, you know, in the same way that people have a preoccupation with nutrition and what goes in their bodies, we should be just as censoring of the content that we consume, because that's impacting kind of how we see the world and what we're even able to, to think about. I think to expand the spectrum, I would just say that the environment and the, and the technological environment that we're living in that create this new market and everything also create an environment of much higher precarity and, and lack of stability. And you know, when you don't feel like you know what's going to happen to you soon, you're starting to live in a fear around the future. And the fear is the, the, the kind of a feeling that makes you start listening to and hearing different conspiracy theories and finding problems outside of your own known environment. And that's very you know, uh, nutritious for paranoia. And uh, unfortunately... And for the, fascist uh, leadership. Uh, exactly. No, that's, that's exactly uh, how, how it comes uh, to the fora. And, uh, well, maybe you sh we should talk about the witches because we're more fun than uh, yeah. than the fascists. Uh, no. yeah. I think maybe we'll uh, open up to yeah, the audience. Are there any uh, questions? Thanks, first of all, to Mark and Alexa. Thank you Do we have a microphone without a cable here? I don't know. Sarah, is she somewhere? No. Okay, so if you have a question, you have to come. And they don't have to be questions. You, a lot of or people here shout. that I recognize your face, you're an amazing human with ideas um, and things you're working on. So maybe you could share some of those. Okay. So questions. Yeah. Hi. I really like the metaphor of the spaceship Earth. And um, I would really like to go into that a bit further because what I feel it's almost like the metaphor for the 21st century, that humanity doesn't have a shared vision anymore, that countries don't have a shared vision anymore. Um, I was born in Eastern Germany, and you know, the vision of my parents was to get out of the country into the world. Germany as a whole you know, had the vision after the war to have a roof and food for everyone, and that meant economic growth. And it also led to the society being happy, like everyone was feeding was more happy. And so the alignment between what the state was doing, growing economy and growing happiness, was aligned. But at some point, it, it became separate because we did not update the societal system so that it, we did not necessarily just need more resources, more money. And we kind of split and so many subcultures from right. You are not in the same situation like your neighbor anymore. And what really would be beautiful would be have a vision where you know everyone can get behind imagining a future that we all want to share and inhabit. And that has to be so much more. It has to be in media, Hollywood, how many movies actually tackle and a utopia, right? It's almost dystopia, going to the fear-based consciousness almost. And we have now the chance to tell a story that people can get behind. All about telling a story people buy to make it a self fulfilling prophecy. All everyone likes the story, we can make it happen. The possibilities of technology are wider than ever, it's which path we choose. And we just need to understand each other and what everyone wants. So, how do we move not spaceship Earth, 
what makes a time shift, we move to space towards the future. Where do you want to go? What does the time look like? Seeing that you have become part of it. I think you, I mean, you make me think a lot about a lot of different things. Um, <laughs> so the f one concept that um, I'm excited about is this idea of mesh prophecy, right? So how do we all sort of begin to write that story together? How do we all tap into some of our own prophetic, you know, urges beyond just like watching TED Talks that are really lame? Uh, how do we sort of unleash that capacity within each other for some of that sense making? Um, and it's funny because now I'm in this whole market of like being a talking head, which I'm using Robin Hooding to subsidize other projects. But at the same time, the only reason there's a market for me to like run around with this book is because people are so scared about everything, like what's happening, like the economy, like society. And so they invite these people and they pay them lots of money to be these kind of like false prophets about like what they should do and like five principles for being a misfit and stuff. And so to me, it's sort of entertaining, but also, um, yeah, points to this, to this sickness. And I think part of uh, your initial question also addresses this point around uh, have we out that the market economy and well-being used to be more connected. And somehow that lost its way. And I remember, you know, in my own experience, my mother's side of the family were from Constantinople, like uh, when it was more Greek and then the Turks kicked them out. And so they were always experiencing as these sort of Greek immigrants, this experience of exodus, where they were voluntarily kind of choosing to leave a place for economic opportunity. And this is what happens. This is part of the liberal economic dream that you somehow, success is built on disembedding yourself from community. And I think now so many young people that I meet are really trying to activate more powerful forms of community. Um, that we don't want to just follow this kind of liberal labor market and end up anywhere, that we're searching for belonging, that we're searching for uh, you know, wisdom traditions that you can't Google, um, which is you know, deeply frustrating. Uh, and so I think, it's, I think it's really, yeah, I think it's a very powerful moment. We're working on a project called Neo Tribes at the moment with Pedro also looking at this phenomenon. You know, how are people coming to live outside of mass society together? Um, the idea of the one story feels too monolithic to me. Um, I do think there's a ton of narrative work to be done right now um, in terms of being able to kind of strip away the, some of the tribalism, some of the brands that are these keepers of wisdom, and find out you know, what are the insights from some of these different traditions that we can learn from? How do we remix them? How do we make them appropriate to a younger generation? How do we modernize them? How do we digitize them? Um, so this is, yeah, this is the active conversation, um, which is really around this, this kind of neo-tribal post-nation capacity. At the same time, there's a total shadow right now in society um, that's all about Retribalization re in a very negative way, in a very dark way, around some of this fear. Um, but it's interesting that these things are happening in parallel. Uh, okay, so since you call my darkness, then uh, I will speak from the darkness, which is Eastern <laughs> Europe, basically. Uh, that's where it sits. Is, is it, I, I find your uh, comment and uh, kind of a form of a question uh, very beautiful and very naive at the same time, because I think humans from day zero we're always feeling that they're living in a special times and there's some wisdom somewhere. And, uh, and Earth is not a spaceship in the first place um, that we can control, forget about controlling it and so forth. So that's from the darkness, hello. Uh. But the, the lack well, of control is interesting. Else, but then we can destroy, right? So we found it from someone else left that's behind. Right. So in that sense, it is a spaceship floating in space. If it's gone, you know, it cold and dark and dead. Okay, next question. <laughs> okay, maybe I can just add to this metaphor of uh, funneling set. Um, because I, I was wondering why you picked that specific metaphor. I mean, it's like 50 years old, and it's part of that techno-liberal dream, you know, like Fuller was a kind of ambivalent figure. Um, he did very good things, of course, but also not necessarily things we can adopt today. And um, so if you would, you know, look for a metaphor of a completely controlled environment, 
you would pick a spaceship, you know, because it's so vulnerable, and it's, um, you know, if you have, would have a misfit as part of the crew in a spaceship, you know, everything would be lost, you know, somebody with a gun in a spaceship, you know, will blow the whole thing away, you know. And the ones who are deciding, you know, where the spaceship's going is not the ones who are on board, it's not the crew, it's the institutions on Earth, you know, it's NASA and everything else, you know, algorithms and whatever. So I think the metaphor must be, we might have to come up with a new metaphor, you know. I mean, it was taken from, in a specific frame of time, of course, you know, everybody thought we were in a specific time. In the 60s, when they had first had, uh, you know, the man on the moon, and they could look back on Earth, you know, this is like really what uh, was an outcome of the space travels, you know, not so much to actually reach the moon, but to be able to look back at the system and see the closeness of the system. But in fact, it's not a closed system, as we know, there's energy pouring in and all that kind of thing. So um, maybe another saying by Fuller uh, would be more interesting for us today, that's 100% of resources for 100% of humanity. I mean, this is a challenge we can live up today, you know, with all the uh, migration happening, all the refugees, what you just mentioned, you know, the tribalization, because the concerns are not really that different, you know, no matter where you look, no matter what culture you're in, you know, you want to live safely, you want to raise your kids, you want to survive, you know, you want to, you know, it's not really that big of a deal, but the ones who have to adapt to that kind of basics is probably the more, the most sophisticated capitalist uh, societies, which we are part of, and I think so we have to look after that. I would like to have a takeaway from me, so I would like you to give me a trick or a tip. A question, first a question, I will explain it later. The question is, how can a digital misfit reach, uh, uh, change the habits of persons who only take the information or the orientation inside of their peer group? We had an election yesterday in Germany, four countries, 12 million people. We had quite small movement to the right. We had the same movement in France, and I think we are all afraid what goes on in America with Trump as well. Uh, my question is, we have good newspapers, but nobody reads them anymore. And we have good journalists, but we don't have a, they're not spread the information very much. So what we have is that the people who are more or less right-oriented only read the information which they become out of their own people. So for me, a misfit should be able to disrupt that. So do you have a tip? Um, well, one concrete idea. I was You brought up this idea of the app that people were using to diagnose health, um, like if there was a sick person. Um, what I would love that app to do is basically track people that disagreed with me. So if there were like a Trump supporter crossing the street, I could like chase them down and then intervene and like talk to them. Um, because I think we have lost this ability <laughs> to, um, to really communicate with people outside of our bubble. And so how do we do that? And it has to, maybe it could be this kind of random matchmaking app. Another friend of mine started this fake app um, that was like chat roulette but it was basically just, it was during the election cycle and it would just pair you with people that had really opposing political views to you and then you could just yell at them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, where are the spaces for that, for those kinds of conversations to happen? Um, I think it would be funny to do it with a sense of humor, to have people sort of voluntarily enter these spaces where they really had to find people with very dissonant viewpoints. And I think it's also about where we spend our time. I'm, you know, in my own life, like Berlin has been incredibly nurturing for me, but I also um, am really excited to spend time in places that, you know, where everyone doesn't think the same things about me, where people don't know like what a cacao ceremony is or haven't just done like ayahuasca yesterday, but you know, where they have very different kinds of realities going on. Um, and so I think, how do we all act as, you know, better 
ambassadors for some of the ideas that we have. I think we need a lot of compassion for other people, but we also have to spend time with them. We have to be part of communities that are more diverse. We can't, um, you know, as amazing as this POC experience was, it was all people that were really sold on, you know, climate change that believed it was a horrible thing. It was people that believed in open source eco-hacking. It wasn't particularly diverse. Um, so as we create more of these intentional communities, what are invitations to people with radically different perspectives? And I hope that, you know, salons are very popular right now and maybe that provides a format where more arguments happen, where more people with different perspectives can happen, um, as well as like joke startup apps would be useful. Yeah, you should hang out with Alexa more because then uh, you'll be happier in your in your life, I think. And she already gave you seven ideas for good startups. You just write them down and uh, get the money. Um, and I think it's, that's what, what what you said is very important because that's about disruption. This is how you kind of steer the system where you create environments in which you can uh, take people outside of the bubble, if you like. But to answer your question and kind of in a in a in a different way, and uh, and there's no app for that, unfortunately, I can think of right now is that. The, the most challenging part when you uh, try to move those who are, n you know, neutral or uh, not interested or don't want to be engaged is that they have certain set of beliefs and values that they are running their life using as a kind of a you know compass. And when you talk about habits and, and beliefs, uh, you know, all of us we would read things that support our beliefs and values rather than that I question them. And that's nothing unnatural in what you just said. That is a very you know, natural way of how we build our worldview, if you like. And what's interesting, however, if what we're seeing right now is much harder, it seems, to get out of the bubbles when you use technology to mediate that information because it's easier to stay within them and it is kind of noise of one specific view uh, than it was before. I think we were more prone to be disrupted and getting outside uh, before technology, I, I, I would say. And so, yes, app would be a great starting point, or even few of them, especially the funny ones, because humor is uh, very important to get people outside of the box that they're sitting in. Um, on the other hand, we have to look at, at in the long run, uh, they won't do what we want them to do. So we have to figure out other ways of how we learn from each other and build you know, the, the knowledge about what's going on in the world. No, that's that's all I want to say, actually. Hey, um, this is a question mainly for Marek, I think. Um, you talked a lot about uh, the sort of dangers and the moral failings of big businesses, and in particular, big tech businesses like Google and Facebook. Um, we also touched on briefly the sort of relative nature of legality and morality. Uh, my question is, like, are there big companies that have maintained their ethics, their kind of good ethics? Are there, or are big companies sort of always evil? And if they're not always evil, how do they maintain their goodness? What are the sort of principles that they should strive for? I don't think that evil is in the company, <laughs> though I think Google may be evil now, uh, regardless of what they say about it. Uh, I think the evil is in between the individual and the, and the, and the corporation and the company because um, Google is so powerful not because they pay us for that. You know, they're using our data and they make money of that and our labor is free. Uh, we work for them, you know, from 7 in the morning till midnight. Uh, non-stop, but we don't feel like we're working. We feel like we're empowering ourselves. And I think the evil is in between these two. And so what I was saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming corporations for where we are at now with uh, how we can use data and information and technology in a political way. I think this, uh, p this paradox is more important that they cannot live without us and we cannot live without them. <laughs> Um, and if there are any other corporations, some, some, there's a number of businesses, some of them are in Berlin, that are trying to have some code of conduct that are experimenting with, uh, you know, bringing ethics back to the fora. There are designers who think differently about designing products and so forth. Uh, the problem is when you have big money and big responsibility with shareholders, what you have to deliver by the end of the day, day is money. And even when you have to do that, then other things become secondary, tertiary, and so forth. So. Um, it would be interesting to see how we can look at the labor we do in such a way that it has recognized value from the beginning and we know what that value is and we can invest that value in things we want that to be invested. 
Uh, we don't have that opportunity. The system how it is created right now create this invisible bubble in between the cloud or however you want to phrase it, and uh, that it disappears and then appears somewhere else. And so I, I think there's a lot of people who are decent human beings, responsible individuals and groups, and also those are corporations like that, I believe. The problem with, with data-driven corporation is that it is easier to not see what are the consequences of uh, using information. I mean, there's a whole conversation if, Pedro, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about rooted internet, but this whole platform cooperativism conversation, which is some of these digital platforms looking at how they can build cooperative principles into their businesses. Do you want to yes. share? I guess the whole idea started about thinking on how we can restructure the, the ownership point. And I think that is one of the questions that we've been talking about. And this is where, where I guess it's a very simple concept that could align multiple initiatives around this idea, which would, because in many ways, as you were saying, of course, Google might be evil or not. Or not. The, the question is, as the financial system is right now currently structured, it's sometimes it's, it's impossible to go and blame a, a CEO because he's also, he's, he doesn't have a free choice. He might be a conscious human being, but he does have just targets that he has to fulfill and he's not in a position of being able to choose by himself. And I guess what would be the structures that we could create, especially around technology that would and not allow a CEO or a company to get into the position of, especially the person that is leading the company to be, to need to take a decision just for the profit because it's 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 the only way we're creating. So I, I think w we are not necessarily this sick, but we create institutions that have a structure that are making obliging us to 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 deal with it, to to act in this way. So we've been thinking a lot about how to create and how to combine other ways to make sure that we seal the, this idea of ownership in a way that the, the entrepreneurs that are starting in, the, in a direction can maintain purpose-driven and, and, and build companies in a different way. I think, too, to your point around some of these protocols and bureaucracies, it's, uh, Hannah Arendt wrote about this as like the banality of evil, basically. And David Graeber did his book on bureaucracy, really looking at how these command and control systems lead to all these responsibility dumps and also how um, rhetoric, like this corporate rhetoric, can obscure atrocities that are ha actually happening because you're being measured against a scorecard. And so you're actually incentivized to work towards all of these things that could be undermining uh, you know, the positive impact that you could be having in society. But because it meets this other sort of insular rhetoric that's really defined by the financial system and sort of, and scale and growth prerogatives, um, yeah, it can be really dangerous. management right now that is not evil, let's suppose that, which probably is not true, but the, the point there is that the structure in which, the, the way it's structured, we don't know how it's going to get, so how can we build, how can we build it in a certain way that we can trust how a company is not going to be ex, exit in a certain way or be, or the profit is not going to dictate the decisions of, of people in it which of course will lead into, in the current system, it would, it would be much harder to monetize, to, to build such structures, but the long-term effects could be very powerful. I agree with that, but I think we're living in this kind of problematic environment of that this whole system is driven by selling data. And until we come up with something else that would make money for these corporations that create the infrastructure and devices and so forth, then we are in the dead end road because uh, you can only apply kind of software systems of hacking and so on that are parasiting on the, on the, on the infrastructure they're creating. But until we don't find another way for another business model, whatever that would be, then we are stuck with what we have and it's be become more and more evil because there's more and more competition and there's more and more relationship between those who run these institutions and, and power. 
um, that's where we are, I think. I think for me too, this is where I'm more of a Luddite in perspective, but I think it's very dangerous when the abstract economy, this idea that our de data is being harvested and that that's a huge economy and that somehow the digital economy can out um, can be more valuable than the primary economy. I think that when we look at the ratio of sort of primary agricultural goods of like water and food and just basic needs, that you know those are things that we actually have to assign a higher premium to and invest more energy in stewarding. Um, and so I don't know. I don't really you know what would be a path forward in terms of managing these resource constraints. I think part of it is about shrinking parts of the economy that are really unstable and really speculative um, and really investing more energy in you know, basic primary and secondary manufacturing economy and also encouraging um, people to make things themselves. So disintermediating corporations from some of, from production slightly. Okay, I think we, we finished here and move the conversation towards the bar. And thanks again, Alexa, Marek. Uh, it was amazing, uh, the, the conversation was great. So applause to our guests. <laughs>